times. Next one. Not too short. All right. <coughs> All right, I would like to uh, welcome you to the uh, August 19th. What is it, 2014? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the Board of Directors meeting, regular meeting. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask for a roll call. Director Bernstein? Present. Director Ianson? Here. Director Crawley? Present. Director Carpenter? Present. Director Solano? Present. <laughs> <laughs> He's calling in. All right. If you would, follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, there is a report out of closed session. And it is as follows. That the board directed council not to file an initial statement of exemption to the administrative law, judge's proposed, law judge's proposed decision on curb case number 669-L. Yes. 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 And the vote was five to nothing. Okay. We've our legal requirements. Good. That brings us to comment, uh, public comment number two. The first one was in closed session. Is there any public comment? And that means you can talk on anything basically you want to. There is no public comment. Okay, that brings us on to the Menlo Park Firefighters Benevolent Activities Report. Sure. Hello everybody, my name is Aaron MacDonald, I'm the president of the Metal Park Firefighters Association. I have one thing to report, uh, that was a Relay for Life. It's something we've been taking part in for probably, you know best, six years, six years now. Um, it was actually started by one of our fire captains who had a, uh, his wife passed away from cancer, so we got involved with it. We were walking to Burgess Park for the last six years. And this year we spent upward of over $500 feeding the people who came out, and we supported it every year. So that's about it, all right after this month. Aaron, what about the chili cook-off? Uh, the chili cook-off has not happened yet. Oh, it's already in it. Yeah, but we're not entering it this year. Okay. Darn. What's that? Darn. Yeah, I know. We couldn't get any people to volunteer this year. You can only move up to the mountain. <laughs> this one's out. Uh, Santa <coughs> City puts it on. Up in there, Central Park. Okay. That concludes. Thank you. Thank you. So that brings us to presentations. It's a presentation of the Menlo Park Fire Protection District in the San Mateo County Health. Silver Dragon 7. Certification. 8. 8. So, President I have sent members of the board, Vanden Hoover, Division Chief, Menlo Park Fire Protection District. We participated in the Silver Dragon exercise for the county, for San Mateo County, for a number of years. This year, uh, we're especially proud of some of the activities that occurred. Carol Parker is going to be doing a presentation relative to that after action report and some of the activities involved in that. We have a, a number of the members of, of that group that are here with us tonight. I'll let Carol go ahead and introduce you. And we also have some, some individuals that were really uh, created some functional expertise for us, uh, Rachel and especially some of the others that are here. And I know Mr. Ivinson and, and uh, uh, other members of the board were there also. So with that, I'll bring up Carol Parker to do the presentation. So while he is doing, uh, bringing up the PowerPoint, I would like to introduce you to my incident command group. There was only one missing, and that's Scott Barnum from Atherton. But right here we have Special Operations, and that's Steve Takey. We have our incident commander, and... Um, Cynthia Bosworth. <laughs> I believe we've been talking to her every day this week. <laughs> we have Rachel Kushikna. Kanoshka. I knew I was going to be on that one. We have Keith Fuller here. He was logistics. And then Jack Wilson, we all know. 
was part of the um, team that went out in the field in the willows, and John Mosby, who was our index. And then um, direct, oh, Alan Douglas right here was operations, we have a background on that. And then um, Director Carpenter was actually in the command trailer <coughs> helping with communications. Okay. And uh, Rex uh, Einstein, or Director Einstein was there helping <coughs> observe and giving us a lot of pointers of what we could do better in the future. <coughs> do you want me to do it late? Mm -hmm. Hold on up. So my name is Carol Parker and I'm uh, the Emergency Services Specialist here at the Menlo Park Fire District. And tonight I just want to do a quick presentation over Silver Dragon 14, 2014. Um, and we will be going over the history of Silver Dragon, the importance of CERT, Silver Dragon 2014 objectives, <coughs> progression of Silver Dragon, and key learning. <coughs> So Silver Dragon started with the San Mateo County Health Department when the federal government offered them a grant to, and in the event there was an anthrax event that um, came into San Mateo County. So what they use is they use the pull-push method. They want to pull people into a facility to hand out medications, and that's one way they do it. The other way is to push it. They want to push the medications out in the community and hit as many families and homes that they can. So they came up with the Silver Dragon. The concept is to take handouts that they give us with uh, community outreach brochures and then we put them on every house. And every house is a, is a medication for a family of four. So this started in 2007, and it started with one agency, and that was Foster City. In 2014, it's now expanded into 22 different participating agencies. Okay, we all know in a major event, the district's gonna be overwhelmed. We have 25 firefighters on duty, and we have 93,000 residents here. I had a question that, that was said about 10 years ago, but with Facebook going in, we probably have another 10 to 20,000 people here in the district. So CERT, our, what we're doing is we're trying to independently organize incident command teams, pre-identify them, and be able to plug them into the SMC alert system. That way, if we ever have an event and we need an incident command team that we know has been trained, utilized, they can, they can organize spontaneous volunteers, they can provide us with early communications, a windshield survey in the district. They can work with first responders to reduce their responses. On the other like flip side that, they know their neighborhoods better than we do and they will be able to help first responders let them know where people with disabilities, the older people, and help them locate injuries. So right here we have a little graph and we have the Menlo Park Fire District and then we have our command teams. And the, the things with the, the squares with the stars are actually what we utilized during Server Dragon. So we, we utilize the technology. Server Dragon, we really want to really push the communications aspect on it. And the command team. We really want to build these teams up. We want the team that just got done doing the incident command to actually mentor the next team so we can keep rostering up. And then we want to build on their skills. We want them to be able to feel confident enough to be able to go out there and just put together their own incident command post and, and direct these people on what they should be doing next. This is where I don't know. Yeah. So, um, 
it needs to be clicked on the bit, but not yet. So I'm going to talk about some of our objectives and what we accomplished. But can you click on the? volunteer participation, 58, and then we were number one on houses per hour, 853. County observers that came, we had CDC come, we had Red Cross come, uh, we had the director of Seven Hill County Health come and observe, and their feedback to us was, it was wonderful. I mean, information systems were impressive, strong coordination with all agencies involved, I see well informed, handled ingest in calm, coordinated fashion. We got really good feedback from from the CDC and the, the president of San County Health. Okay. So you go back, you you hit back. So hit the back button. So now hit develop command team. Sorry, I should have known. <laughs> so this slide, I really, I really would love my incident commander Cynthia Bosworth to to elaborate more on this. But I, I will go over. She was the one experience everything in incident command. Some of the things she was telling me, I didn't even know happened. But I do know that. Everybody that helped in the incident command center, this was the first time that they have done that job. We, they have never played incident commander nor logistics. And um, another thing, Cynthia was always on top of things, making sure that that we were two, three deep in case something. She was not going to let anything happen. <laughs> so we did lose our operations chief, and that was two weeks prior to the exercise. So we had Alan Douglas here who stepped in, was very nice, last minute, um, not a lot of time. And then our lovely Keith here, 12 hours before the exercise, the night before, decided he had to work <laughs> and he wasn't going to be able to make it. So we were able to pick up the slack. Cynthia was able to get another logistics chief officer to come and, and help with that part of it. The, um, the detail that went into what Cynthia did as a incident commander was unbelievable. And detailed action. When she says action, deliverables, deadlines, she needs it. And so she was not missing a detail. She was always thinking ahead with the planning section about what risks, um, the future of the events. She even got Kings Mountain involved because they were curious of what we were doing here in the district. They had heard about it from one of our certs. So she included them in the exercise and let them um, come in the command post and, and, and mentor. Back. Rachel actually just took the CERT class um, less than a year ago. Yeah. And I didn't realize the talent that she had in her when it comes to communication. So she came in, set up her own radio, took charge, and she was flawless during the communications part. Since we brought Rachel in to now do communications, we took Paul Jamelian out, who is, was our, our radio person. And he was actually out there doing real live GPS. You can see at the bottom here. So
So he had GPS ham radios, and he could track them in the incident command trailer. And then we were also taking real-time photos of just things that were out there, but actually in a real event, it could be Chief, are you? In a real event, uh, this could be actually getting um, things that are going on out there back to the incident command center here for the fire district. Uh, we did purchase 10 radios, and we're hopefully going to be able to store them in a trailer. I know that's on your agenda tonight. And we have them all pre-programmed -pre with our radio channels. So that way, when the incident command team sets up an incident command post, they can actually hand out these radios on the scene and start operations right there. Ham radios? Ham radios, yeah. Okay. So, I was really excited. Steve here took on the challenge. I know the fire district does the T-card system, and we really wanted to find a way to get people checked in in a real-life scenario. So, as people were coming in, Steve did the T-card, it worked out perfectly, and it was, it was an easy tracking method for the search Um Several teams deployed without any maps. We ran out of houses. So we had, had to pre-arrange the maps, but we ran out of houses and we just, uh, the incident commander sent them in another direction and they figured it out what area they were gonna do and they took it upon themselves. The outdoor public retail setting that we did it in, this was different. You know, we, we had to think about safety, streets, um, restrooms, usually we're in the firehouse. Uh, in this picture, actually, that it got so hot during the day, we had to start moving tables and putting them in shades. And um, we had an outdoor food service, Zoe's Cafe, and she did a wonderful job catering the event. So next slide. Next slide. So much for being fancy. So, okay. No, we already did that. So the next one? Yeah. No. The key learnings. Uh, oh, these are uh, most of the feedback that we got at the end. And a lot of the certs that were on the incident command team, they really wanted a checklist. So when you send out the operations, they want to be able to pick something up and say, this is what I need to do. Boom, 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 boom. And then um, Chief I, uh, Director Ianson, he brought up the PAR, Personal Accountability Report. Absolutely, we should be doing that every half hour. Uh, we actually lost three people. And um, I actually got lost in 2009. Yes. <laughs> Thanks to uh, Thank that same Director Carpenter, but <laughs> the one threw me in his bus. In the rainstorm. In the rainstorm. <laughs> and um, so that, that one will definitely make sure we enforce in the next the next silver dragon. Um, we wanted to find what the district wants. The district wants information fed in, but they don't want broken legs and, and you know, do you don't want people that are doing CPR. I mean, what information actually should we tell the CERT people to, to feed back? Is it house fires? I don't, I would guess not, but structural damage. So we're not really clear on what the ECC would like to see. And then on the INJEX, we really want to make them designed to train our CERT members um, just for the exercise that we're doing and not throw out unrealistic uh, events that would not happen most likely during that scenario. So we're going we're gonna to tap into that and, and we're not going to have a bus 
with 50 kids crashed during, you know, during a pandemic. So here's uh, the slide that the San Mateo County, the statistics that they put out, just for your reference. And you can see where, where we had the most uh, people, participation. activate that template in the Silver Mosquito. I know most of you were there, so I don't want to go into details, but it was a wonderful experience, and the San Mateo County Vectors Mosquito people actually took it to their national conference, and they're using it as a template in, with all the Net West Nile virus going on. And I mean, I can see where everybody will start using these certs members to help get the information out and look for these houses that are infested with mosquitoes. So, next one. So that's the end of my, my presentation. Do you have any questions? Do you want anything to add? And I mean, Cynthia, I might, maybe? Thank you.
perfect, but I think we started on the right track. We just need to keep at it. And part of that's my fault because I haven't been real diligent about doing that. I will try harder. But thank you all for participating. I, I have a comment also, Rex. Sure. I, um, I worked with Steve on the National Night Out a couple weeks ago, and um, I just want to say, I, in talking to na our neighbors, I live in the Willows, um, about one block from Cafe Zoe, but in talking to people, there's a huge demand for this kind of training, and um, I would like to encourage, and I'm doing my best on the board, to encourage more training for more people. I'm not talking about an extra class of 30, I'm talking about an extra class of 2,000 or something like that. I, I really, there are people there, particularly parents of young children, who would like to see some sort of abbreviated training that would deal with their own household and their own family, which is part of the, the basic training. And then there are people that want to go beyond that. And I know once people get involved a little bit, they also want to get involved more. So I just want to encourage us and do whatever we possibly can to reach out. I think it would be great if we could train half the city residents. Jeff, so. one of the things I would encourage us, you know, when you look at how well the, the CERT volunteers did here, I think one of the things we might want to think about uh, is, is spending more time with developing people who can train other people. Uh, we put a terrific burden on the people on the fire district staff for training. And it's typically on weekends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I think we have the skills in our CERT volunteer group so that they can begin doing training of other other people. And particularly the sort of the take care of yourself training. Um, and Rex and other people who've been involved in training for, for many years you know, know how it just sort of grows. You, you know, the old Chinese model was watch one, do one, teach one. <laughs> so um, I would like to encourage us to think about ways that we can take this cadre, who we, who I think now are very skilled, and, and find ways that they can um, help us train other people. Yeah, I'd like to just add on, I think it's important, I was glad to hear that tonight we're talking, or Manny mentioned that we're talking about two different models. One is a model of a self-sufficient group that in a major catastrophe where communications are down, roads are impassable and so forth, people can start by doing some things in their own neighborhoods. And the second thing is then to be able to incorporate those people into an incident command uh, system to do larger things. But I think we need to keep both of those models in mind. And I'm glad that we're talking about <coughs> that. Way. Please keep it up. <coughs> Thank you all. <coughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, wait, you're going to leave? You're not interested Have I shamed you into it? <laughs> leave while you have the chance. Yeah. <laughs> the consent calendar is coming up. <laughs> yeah, come on. Uh, okay.
PERS, pensions, what's going on not only in California but uh, around the country and so forth. And uh, it's uh, just hope we will be able as a board to do something about this because the situation seems to be worsening rather than ameliorating. Yeah, I have about 80 people who run that distribution list, and most of them are elected and appointed local people. Anybody who wants to be on that distribution list, just send me an email and I'll add you to it. It's blind, so your email is not blasted out to everybody else. You can just get a copy of it. And what I've done is I've set up a, a search engine that works for things related to fiscal stability, pensions, um, things related to sort of the operation of a, of a local agency. Sure. So this is just to report out. Um, so the Mineral Park Girls Scout Troop uh, has contacted me to help them get this new map called Pulse Point into the county. San Mateo County is the only county I think that they've told me about that it doesn't have Pulse Point. And essentially it's an app that would alert um, people who use the app would help save lives for if someone has a heart attack. And at this point, we're, I've, I've helped them bring this to San Mateo County and law enforcement in particular, because he said he's had an interest in this, and they're moving forward with it. And um, I know that once this gets approved by the county, that um, they will the rolling scouts will go out to uh, make a presentation to our fire board. The chief has been involved with being, he was contacted by another person who was the head of Menlo Swimming Sport, and so we're all working together to get this app countywide. So thank you, Harold, for that. Cool. Anything else? Okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, I attended the uh, Simpson, uh, the, the Creek Authority, the GPA for you. Oh, thank you. Uh, on the 24th. And on the 26th, I met with uh, Ray Mueller at Cafe So, where he had something to meet the mayor. So uh, I attended those two things. Okay. Anything to report out? It's interesting. Uh, I just did a lot of listening. Okay. Good. Uh, that brings us to the finance report, finance committee report. Okay, so. Peter and I sit on the finance committee, so Peter, feel free to chime in if I'm missing yeah. something. We had a meeting. Um, most of the items from the meeting are in tonight's agenda, but just to give a, a brief recap, one is in the consent agenda. This consent agenda, and I just wanted to um, just reiterate what happened there, and it's basically to specify um, who the treasurer is within the district if the chief couldn't make it so that there was no open ended. Um, uncertainty about who the chief was. Right now, we don't have an administrative services manager, so the chief is designated treasurer, but in the, in the event that the chief wasn't or couldn't be the treasurer, that decision would go back to the board um, so that you, the board would know who a specific person is. And that person could be recommended by the chief, but in any case, the board would be able to know specifically who that was. Two, uh, regarding the the um, Uncle Jackie cash flow analysis, basically the the committee is recommending that we set aside a reserve um, to have to pay down bonds that are callable in 2019, um, just to have an option, you know, just to, just to have that available to us. And then we'll be discussing that tonight in the, um, in the meeting under agenda item 15. And the third item was regarding the investment policy, and really the main thing there was just to switch the language to add in treasurer generically versus um, specifically a, a position like administrative services manager. So that's also um, in the agenda under or in, in the in the agenda under um, item number 16. So that's pretty much it for the finance committee. Let's hear has some. Thank you. I have a quick question. Sure. Did, did any of these reports change from the time they were in the um, packet for the Finance Committee to, to tonight's for, packet? For which, you mean the investment policy and the cash flow analysis? Yes. Not that I know of. 
There so were there were minor changes at your at, at the directors from the finance committee's from the direction. Yeah. yeah, but well, what do you when you're isn't doing that actually on the fifteen on the regular agenda? Well, I mentioned this before. It's really, I mean, these are very long and very difficult reports to go through. And I, I read them as part of the Finance Committee, and then I didn't know whether I needed to read them again as part of our packet. And I, I, you know, so there was a change before the Finance Committee meeting happened, because they sent us an incorrect version for the cash flow analysis. They sent me percent an incorrect version and received an updated version, which I think is in here. So yes. that is the most... So is the red highlighting that... For the, is, is that what happened at the meeting? I'm but just trying to understand. Are you talking about the investment policy? I'm I mean, looking at number six, item 16. Which is the investment policy. Yes. So, so the red is what the committee decided on? Well, the red actually was in there before, or during the finance committee meeting, where um, those are the changes so that are being made to the investment policy. So when we get to item 16, can we hold up okay. this discussion sure. until then? Yeah. I mean, I just wanted to give you an overview of what happened. but. Chuck, we can, let's talk about it when we get to item 16, okay? Thank you. Um, report from the fire chief and discussion and direction. Has everybody read the fire chief's report? Does he have any comment on anything you put in there? I do have some comment. Uh -oh. uh, one of the questions that's related but not necessarily in here, Director Carpenter had asked me about uh, the cost for the landscaping, specifically the artificial turf for the fire stations which was installed at stations 1, 3, 4, 5, and 77 which was uh, just under 40, or excuse me, just under $44,000. Uh, there was an additional $10,000 at station 4 that was spent. So that was one of Director Carpenter's questions about facility related issues uh, that isn't fully uh, articulated in here, but uh, that was the cost. It does save water, it does save fuel, we don't have to mow it so it saves time and it looks pretty good. It also allows us to do different things still on the front lawns and the buildings that relate to putting a prevention sign during the seasonal times when that goes on or, or whatever we need to do. And so I just want to make sure I covered that because I know there was some concern about it. just spending money on artificial grass. Uh, we didn't do that at the 170 building, which has drought-resistant landscaping, which looks nice, but it wasn't practical to do it at, at every fire station. So. <coughs> Other than that, uh, item number, I think it is one, comes up later on under liaisons. And uh, the other one, which I also believe comes up later, is, uh, or we can do it now, is the water supply issue. And Bob Block's here to help me out with that. I know, it's, again, Director Carpenter had concerns about the downtown water supply system. And not so much in my report, but hopefully right behind it, is a handout that says attachment to commercial sprinkler systems downtown Mill Park. And the blue, if you got color, which I hope you did, uh, are the sprinkler buildings in downtown Mill Park. The yellow is partially sprinklered. Uh, Mill Towers is a good example of that. We have a standpipe system, but not a sprinkler system. And then the, the pink is non sprinkler buildings. The white represents residential structures that were not included as part of the commercial inventory down there. And Bob has a PowerPoint slide, right? Yeah, there's some. You want to put it together with the primary roots, or do you want to do it individually? Let's, on do, it, let's do it on this one right now, since we're okay, for the partials. But he's gonna, he's gonna get that thing fired screen. up again. The point here is, I know Director Carpenter's question yeah, was about downtown water supply, the downtown specific plan, and the, what's going on downtown. Hopefully, this draws a little bit better picture as well when it goes to the point in my report with working with the city of Mellow Park and the fire ordinance and what that would do with, with uh, lowering the threshold or changing the threshold for sprinkling buildings from assessed valuation to a percentage of construction, which is more in line with what most of the jurisdictions are doing. So the 84 ordinance is what, what I'm referring to there. But what's all tied in here is growth, water, and then who has what and, and who, have, who doesn't have sprinklers and so forth downtown. The, the issue with downtown, I know it was in a paper that was a concern by the board of what the mayor of Mendel Park said, it wasn't exactly correct when I think he mentioned that we were an impediment to growth. I don't agree with that. But uh, I think what's an impediment or has been an impediment to growth downtown Mendel Park or change has been 
uh, the legacy owners and so forth. So and the parking and different things. It's not it's not an easy it's not an easy thing you can point to which one, but as a cumulative issue for all of them, our concern for the fire district is infrastructure. So Bob's going to go over kind of what's underneath the grid that we show here. Again, these are sprinkler versus non-sprinkler buildings. You can see the vast majority of buildings are not sprinkler downtown. Uh, and that's probably because the owners don't want to do it. Or if they've done any tenant improvements, uh, I don't know if they did them all legally. We found on several fires we've had that they were done illegally. Uh, and so, you know, it's hard to catch all those because of the tenant improvements that are going on. Uh, Bob's going to show the infrastructure grid for the water supply. Okay, so we got to go to the water supply there, Chief. Mm -hmm. Which is all related. Right. So the Chief and I had a discussion on the uh, infrastructure for downtown. Um, in all reality, Menlo Park is in good shape with water available um, downtown. So hydrant placement's good. The um, amount of water we talked about, the Chief and I went through a discussion on, you know, I want to build a 40,000 square foot building down there. We pulled out the water flow, gave them a reduction of 50% for a sprinkler building, because a new building would be sprinkler. And I, we were over on uh, Maloney Street, I think we were looking at yeah. there on the, on the infrastructure in the back. And the water is available for downtown. Um, so Cal Water, it's, it's not phenomenal. But it it would be efficient. When you say water, are you talking about the water pressure? I just, what what it comes down to, yeah. director, is the, is the code says you have to have X amount of gallons per minute available for X amount of square footage. They we consistently give a fifty code allows seventy five percent reduction. We say that around a fifty percent reduction, which is really common in the Bay Area, um, because we have infrastructure. So the cities that don't have infrastructure, it's important to get the 75%. But with the 50% reduction, it can, because of the sprinkler building, the water changes dramatically. So it says you would have to have 4,000 gallons a, mi a minute available for this type of construction. Let's say it's wood or concrete or whatever it may be. And then they would go down to 2,000 gallons a minute available for a fully sprinkler building. Uh, I had the, cover coat, the code in here too. Sorry, director. Uh, have to go the down color code. Frank, the good scroll down to the bottom. So it makes sense. Okay. I had the impression though, when we had this discussion a number of years ago, that there wasn't sufficient capacity downtown. You're saying that's not the case. It's, it made improvements. Cal Waters made some big improvements. On University Ave going down, they put in a 12 inch line. So what she's talking about here is in the legend, it's showing that you know a green is six inch, uh, the red is eight inch, ten and twelve. So when our typical residential community would have a six inch main, um, water for a residential structure would only require a thousand gallons a minute if it's under 3,600 square feet. So in the downtown area, they have it gridded. So with the water, the infrastructure there being gridded together, you get X amount of gallons again combined. So although we can only get how many gallons out of a four and a half inch connection? 900 gallons, 1,000 gallons a minute, maybe. What they do is they read it with a pedo gauge and it'll tell you how much water, how fast the water's coming out and what's available. Maybe 2,500 gallons, 3,000 gallons is, a, is what's considered available. So just like the challenge we had for Facebook, they needed, they were way over the chart on the square footage for the building, but it stops it. 280,000 square feet or something like that. So they blew the chart away. So the code says that's the max you gotta have, 8,000 gallons. They get a reduction of 50%, they needed 4,000 gallons. So that's on a major scale. Mm -hmm. So there's parts downtown, like I'm saying on university where they have the 12 inch, they probably have 6,000 gallons available a minute. And that's, and that's, that's an what, upgrade that's taking place. In that's an upgrade that took place about four, four or five years ago. Okay. Our partnership with, with uh, Cal Water has been phenomenal. Um, it's, it's been, I, I'm proud of it. And so there's areas there. What, what we did talk about, <coughs> going back to some of the meetings about the ordinance, was trying to make it user friendly to get more sprinkler buildings downtown that have zero lot lines. I mean, the buildings are touching. 
and trying to do something in these parking lots, as you can see in the back here, between Santa Cruz and Oak Grove, is tying those together so they would be gridded. And now it could be a shared main. There is no formal um, agreement. Yeah, agreement, I guess that's what we have to say yeah. to do that. It was I, I, we suggested it to them to go, hey, let's work with downtown, let's back off our requirement of the density that we were pushing before and make it affordable for downtown and call that a fire main and they can all share it instead of everybody doing an individual backflow assembly. And <coughs> it was received good by one of the council members and, and now that we have different people in public works, I think it's something that should be explored and it'll make it very reasonable for those shop owners to put in sprinklers because the large cost is in the infrastructure to do that for the existing building. The new buildings, it's a cost, but that's a, a planned cost. Well, we're still only looking at what, one, one and a half percent for the total building cost? Not, the commercial changes dramatically compared to the residential. I mean, I don't, I don't know the percentage off the top of my head. I'm going to guess get into the five percentile range for commercial. Okay. New building. Okay. Yeah. Because the underground infrastructure is expensive. I want to ask a clarifying question. Who owns the infrastructure of the pipes and things? Cal Water. Cal Water. And what's their incentive for keeping that up or whatever? Kind of back to the relationship that I talked about. They, we worked with them back with the Atherton Grand Jury Report, and we really got together and explained our challenges and how to get our ISO rating improved and all these other things, and they took it serious. We supported them through the PUC getting letters out, they were doing, they were adding 20 hydrants a year is what they promised us. The last couple of years it's backed off, they haven't had the money to do so. They've had a difficult time with the city of Menlo Park because of some of the constrictions and bonds that they put on them. So they're working with the county area and Atherton a little more fluently. Do they get reimbursed by the city when they put in they the They do not. No, no, it's charged to the users. Well, the infrastructure they think they care of, the personal hookups, yes, is charged to the user. But no, when I when we pay for water, that money Correct. goes to Cal Water, and the regulatory agencies he mentions, the Public Utilities Commission. So if they're, you know, they are a regulated public utility, and they have certain obligations. And you mentioned that we had worked with the PUC on basically giving them a pat on the back kind of thing. Right. So their incentive is that. They, they don't want to be in a situation, for example, which PG&E was in with San Bruno, where you really screwed up, etc. And that's that's the check and balance for a regulated public utility. It's they also, work with also PMP, paper mm -hmm. management plans. Mm -hmm. So the, the rules in some of these jurisdictions are that you have to pay 10 feet on either side of the trench. It's 5 feet. So 5 feet is the number, and, and they... What they're worried about is the trench failing. So as the chief says, that's in, in the city of Menlo Park, that's their cut and paste detail that you have to replace five feet each side of the trench. So if I'm doing a water line to my house, one inch service, two inch service, relatively small service, you're gonna end up with a minimum of a 12 foot wide patch. Well, that, the cost goes way up. And so anyways, we have new blood over there right now. Um, I was in a meeting last week about the backflow assembly debacle that we've got, and the the mindset is improved, and, and I was thankful for it. Can you explain that? I'm sorry, it's just because I don't understand the thing. So the, the backflow, are you talking about a plan where maybe there'd be like a common backflow that more than one user would share? Absolutely. Absolutely. For downtown. For downtown. For da absolutely. I, I, I say, why not? Well, I'm not disagreeing with yeah. you. I mean, but so. How many, how many different buildings, for example, uh, could, could share? There, there really is not a limit. I mean, it would have to do with the feasibility of how you would get that water from point A to point B. So going back, well, we have Crane to University here. So in, in, a, in a rear parking lot such as that, it could take care of the whole block that faces Santa Cruz, or it could take care of the entire block that's on Oak Grove and Santa Cruz. So if there were a common backflow, how would you pay for the testing and the verification that the valves were working and all of that? Oh, the details of that I don't have. I, I would be... Who does backflow prevention inspections? 
Oh, there's a list a mile long now. It's cast out. You have to pay for it privately. Correct. Okay. Correct. And, and the Chamber of Commerce, we've talked to them. Um, again, there's, there's nothing official on this, but they are excited because we are trying to work. The big plan is to work to make it affordable to have downtown. Is our goal. Well, I, this is really interesting because of ma the major cost of the sprinkling is the backflow. Uh, is the infrastructure. Again, in those parking lots, a lot of those parking lots are in, I'm going to say, bad shape. There was there were plans out there to do a, a multi-level parking garage in one of them. I have not seen that resurface in a couple, three years. And so like, back to what the chief was talking about, when they do the repaving or whatever else, let's get the infrastructure in. Cal Water, I've talked to them, they're, they're all on board. If something makes sense, they do it with Atherton all the time. When they're going to repave the street in Atherton, they let them know, eight months, a year in advance, plan on these streets. Do you have infrastructure improvements you want to do? Yes, no. Do them. Just patch what you tore up. We're going to come through and fix the road anyways. Have a nice day. Makes a lot of sense. This is a good partnership. Very good partnership. So for this, these parking lots, a lot of them are in bad shape. They just did an improvement on the one. Back, you know what parking lot that was? It's on University and one they just redid. Anyways, they just they just redid one, and basically all we got to comment on was, hey, the the driveway entrance has to be big enough to accept the truck so we get access to the buildings. I think we should be more involved in that. I have one more question. If, 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 I'm not exactly sure how it's connected, but if it were a common backflow, does that mean there's only one connection to the main line there? Or well, you're going to get more water if you grid it together. So if you go block to block and tie it together. And the other thing that, that we learned through our times in Atherton with the PUC and everything else is about stagnant water. They don't want stagnant water in their pipe. So they want that pipe moving in a grid type fashion so that it's always moving. But with backflow for just fire service, because it is backflow, then it can be stagnant. So the other thing to take it one more step is not let's not make it a private fire main for the downtown and do it as a shared water, just like public water is, and it's used for the hydrants, the sprinklers, and the domestic water. Then they, then I believe the cow water would allow them, if they're worried about the sprinklers, which they are, to put a um, backflow assembly in their building in a closet. Now it's relatively small. Interesting. But do a shared service. Because then you won't have anybody, what the city's really worried about is they do not want Santa Cruz torn up. So the other relevant point, so the purple, five inch below, that's, we don't, we don't like to see that obviously. Six, as Bob mentioned, is primarily residential, but that's part of downtown is obviously not residential. Ideally, we want to see eight inch, that's kind of the goal. But it also goes back to what the supply is, and again, you mentioned about Verizon where you can feed the water. So it's also conditional upon what type of construction would be used and you know what type of building would be built. But that's the big unknown downtown, obviously, because there's no master plan for how it would all work. But just trying to address, is there adequate water supply? The answer, Bob said earlier, is yes, but yes. it depends right. on what you do and how you do it and the 50% reduction for sprinklers, obviously a new construction. So, you know, we were never trying to, the 84 ordinance never tried to inhibit the property owners, but it tried to encourage sprinkling old buildings that we've had significant fires in. But you gotta put it in context too that we've gone to the city multiple times with a fire ordinance, but they were not adopted. And that's not to put it all on them because there was things in there that they would not agree to. Some years ago, it was residential sprinklers. So they didn't adopt things in the past because once part of it failed, the whole thing failed. <coughs> so we've, you know, we've not been successful primarily because they've never, they've never adopted the ordinance that allowed us to help correct it. And they're working on that right now. It, it's a very uh, brutal ordinance at this time. From 1984 to 2014, you, you literally you do a bathroom remodel, it may trigger it. But there's a lot of buildings downtown that are not 5,000 square feet. There's some 4,995. So uh, again, from, from our perspective is, okay, are we gonna have multiple buildings on fire or are we not? And how are we gonna protect downtown? And now it goes back to really the infrastructure, 
do we have the water for a surround and drown type thing? So we are encouraging, it's a great word, to get downtown sprinkler, but we need the ordinance to help us do it. Uh, have you updated the board on where we're at with the ordinance? Uh, it's in the report, it says that we're working with the city, but it's at the city right now. So. Yeah, we've had good communication. Uh, the new, their interim director of public works, uh, we came up with language and we could talk about that on the primary route if you'd like. Yeah, we can do that when we get to that point. So we just want to, this is proprietary too, so we're always sensitive that Cal Water doesn't want their information. Yeah, right there. thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> The Cal Water again, they, they actually Menlo Park did also. They gave us their water maps electronically as long as we do not share them. Um, our hopes is that they would have those in the BC buggy and you would know where the next main is, was our plan of attack. Is that because of the word about sabotage or something? It, they're private. These, these are their private water services. And and the, this is their business. Yes. Yeah. Right. People figured out not too long ago that water supply is an incredible way to cause a problem in the community. And so if you know where the infrastructure is, it becomes much more vulnerable. So ideally what we would look for and we're working towards is a relationship that we had similar to Atherton with and Cal Water where we're all in a room together working <coughs> on solutions and if we need to support them at the PUC to get more money or more projects. We do that because that's what we did. We, as Bob mentioned, worked out a deal to get X number of high battery <coughs> here wherever we wanted to put them and make improvements. Yeah. And when they did any type of excavation in neighborhoods, we helped set the priority for not just that the street needed to be repaved, but maybe that the water line needed to be upgraded, replaced, or re <coughs> and, and what we did, Chief, so that maybe the whole board will understand, was we actually did a hydrant survey of the entire district. Um, with light duty and, and went through and measured every hydrant, hydrant to hydrant. With that, we came up with a priority list. That was just distance, okay? Too far apart, that type of thing. And then the second was water available. So we have that, they, we share that list. It seems like it gets lost about every other year. Where's that priority list? Menlo Park just recently invited me out to go spot hydrants for the first time. I've been here over 11 years at Menlo Park for the first time. Say, so can you come with us and where do you want the hydrants? Wow. We're moving forward. It was, it was encouraging. Is that the, new guy? Cal, the new guy and another new guy. Yeah. So he called me when I went out there with him. I said, thank you. And he said, what do you mean? I go, this is the first time I've walked with Menlo Park on the streets. So I go with Cal Water a lot. Yes. Years ago, um, I understood that we were encouraging or working with Cal Water to upgrade the hydrants themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, on my property in Atherton, I've got one of the little old dry barrels. Two, two and a half. Two, yeah, the, the smaller one. one. Mm -hmm. Is that, are those planned on being upgraded or is that? I have the impression that those it's are been, considered it's, to be out of, out of, out of date. Or something. They are not our standard. The standard okay. is? They are not our Menlo Park Fire standards. standards. And what is our standard? It's two two and a half and one four and a half. Those are the port size. So okay. two two and a half and one four and a half is what we developed for a standard. So for residential, again, back in the day, which the infrastructure is older in this whole area, the two and a half ports were heaven sent. So mm -hmm. now, for a lot of the larger Atherton homes, okay, we're 18,000 square feet plus on some occasions. That's not efficient water, but it is. So Cal Water is not addressing them as aggressively as they were. They had money reduction. So to answer your question, it's, it's backed off, it's still there, but what's, what just kind of fired <coughs> up is going through the hydrant testing we were gonna do this year, talking to another new guy at Menlo Park He's going to test every one of them, and he is aggressively changing out the dry barrel hydrants. Aggressively. And he's trying to hire new staff to push that even faster. And when we get a billing application for a big, huge building in Atherton, um, do we have the ability to say the condition of approval is you got to upgrade the... We have that by code, yes. Do we enforce that? No. And we, the reason we do not enforce that is because the town of Atherton adopted the ordinance in... 06, 04, 06, when we adopted the ordinance, when they adopted the ordinance, 
we said we will back off asking a private residence to install a hydrant for public use because you have adopted an ordinance. So legally, the district can do that because they have a built-in mitigating measure when they do an addition alteration. The state, 2011, said you will sprinkle a new house. That's across the state. But at the time, Appleton did not. So the only time we will really push that issue is on an extreme flag lot. The problem is working with suppression and everything else, they're like, we get down there and hook to a hydrant, we're, are we gonna get that hydrant? We have a lot of hydrants in the bottom of the court. We need the hydrants not at the bottom of the court so that we can lay in. Yeah. So, so the answer to your question is we do not enforce that on residential. Okay. So we won't go there yet because that's in the report, but I don't have to forget what item it is. But just to kind of close it out, to your questions, Director, which was, is the water adequate? It is, but it depends on what you do. Um, no matter what happens with the downtown specific plan, whether the referendum vote passes or not, whatever happens, we need to be ahead of it, and we need to be more of a partner with the city of Menlo Park, which is looking more encouraging than it's looked in the past, because we need to have some of these conversations about how to fix some of these things, and we can do it. We just need to work together to do it. So, you know, that's kind of the summary. You can see again on the ordinance and the sprinkler issue, it's at Menlo Park. It's, it's going to be really in their control to adopt the ordinance, and that will fix the commercial sprinkler issues. My only concern is people. that I constantly have these conversations with elected officials in Menlo Park, and they wash their hands and say, oh, that happened on a prior prior council's watch. It's not my responsibility. And, and I realize that you guys just do an incredibly good job of trying to build good relationships with your counterparts. Uh, I would just encourage you, if you can do it in a way that doesn't jeopardize those relationships, to make sure you do good documentation. Um, you know, that letter, for example, that we sent in 2011 about the specific plan, you know, is gold when you're having those conversations because they say, oh no, you know, you never asked us to do that. So wait a minute, you know, here's the letter. Um, and I realize that sometimes creating a paper trail can create ill, feel, Ill will. But to the degree you can, I would just encourage you with the city of Menlo Park to do as much documentation as you can. And that's an ongoing task with us. Good. And it, 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 everything goes in the file. Uh, right now, there, as the chief said, we don't have the ordinance in front of council yet, but we have brought them in to our office on just the ordinance specific and said, what don't you like? and sit there together, pull it up on the screen just like this, and work in, in a group and change the verbiage so it's agreeable against with staff. Yeah. Well, I staff. admire your patience, and I just encourage you to document it. Yes, <laughs> understood. I have another comment also, and that is, I, I, I think what you talked about here seems like a huge opportunity that would be beneficial to property owners in the city and the district. And um, I, I don't know how we would take the we, how someone would take the lead on that, but I think it's really important that they that there's an opportunity to get all these buildings sprinkler to save money for each of the owners, and somehow having a summit meeting, doing something where you brought in private contractors, you brought in and you talk about the potential cost savings. I I, I know from my own liaison activities with Menlo Park Council members that at least three of them would be very interested in this idea of a program that saved people a bunch of money and so forth. You are correct, and, and I'll, this is not an excuse. It's the reason why it hasn't gone further. Number one, we're the new people that were not here before. I don't know how to say this politely. You can read between the lines. So, and the other thing is we've had the handcuffs on because of the 1984 ordinance. So our, our 1984 ordinance, which we can't, we, we can't give it up until they adopt a new one, has kept that stronghold there where we have no way over it. And one of the things that I don't think everybody knows is the dollar amount for that 1984 ordinance has been accumulative since 1984. So the comment about if you remodel a bathroom would trigger it, it's not just because you did a bathroom, you did work in 1992, you did work in 1999, and it's accumulative. It's outlived itself. We are the bad guys with the 1984 ordinance in their eyes. Yeah. yeah well, it's, 
as I said, I mean, we've, Even, also, we've offered them a better alternative. You've been to the meetings. <laughs> we've been there many late nights. <laughs> yes. Fair point. Yes. Right. They, they can't be a fire trap forever, particularly if they're talking about developing something and have a city that could be shut I haven't heard of anybody coming in that says, I want to demo a downtown building and build a new one. Right off the I have not been to that meeting yet. Yeah, and one of the things a lot of people don't appreciate is that at the time a lot of those buildings were built, you know, the, the attic space, the space above the ceiling, is just an absolute fire trap. And if you've got a fire going through some of those blocks downtown, it will move from building to building to building. It has. Well, that would hasten redevelopment, wouldn't it? It does. Yes, it would. It hastens sprinklers. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Now, if most people walk into a, a, a store like that and just look up and see a ceiling and a symbol, that's the roof. On most of those structures, that's not the roof. There's a huge attic space about there, which is nothing more than a chimney. I have one more quick question. I'm sorry. It, it, just looking for maybe like a one or two sentence answer. Could you comment on the age of the infrastructure that's in the ground and stuff? I'm, I'm going to say no because they are doing upgrades. So the majority of it's got to be 50 years old, 50 the plus years old. The majority of it is 50 years yeah. old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus. And it's cast iron? Cast iron and AC, asbestos cement. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It's not a whole lot of blue. Yeah, if you look at that. It's not a whole lot of blue blue count. If you looked at that, <laughs> no, the there's not. green are the two colors that you don't. If we can do better than that, we, we, we do it. Like Bob said, they're not they're not running to tear up Santa Cruz Avenue. Now that's a no touch zone. Yeah, Period. that's why the alley, that's why the parking alleys are a good solution for a lot of different things. Meaning you'd run parallel lines. Yeah. New, new lines. Although the thing I find frustrating is they just went all the way down Santa Cruz and dug it up to put in irrigation for planters and didn't do a thing. We're not in those meetings that way. It's not like Atherton, but that didn't happen before there either. Yeah. Until the grand jury report and everybody right. got the room and the board met with the council and yeah. it became a goal. We've, we've, we've said it many times, it needs to be a goal here too, but it just doesn't always stick. One brick at a time. Yeah, exactly. So that's my report. Hopefully it was, uh, hopefully it answered your questions correctly. I'll move for a <laughs> Wait a minute, there's yeah. more. Yeah. Have the whole agenda. <laughs> I know. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Bob, we can take the frame. We can take that one down until we get to Is there anything else on that you, you in your chief's yeah. report that you want to uh, impart? No. All right. That takes us to the consent agenda. I need to pull item number 11 off the consent agenda because I need to recuse myself. I'd like to, I'm sorry, it's very brief, but I'd like to pull off 7, 8, 9, and 10. Chuck, sure. if you just have questions, we can deal with the questions. If, or you can yeah, have, well, I just have questions. Rick? Yes. Yeah, this is Rob. Uh, I just want to add something to the July 15th. Uh, uh, it is. Item number seven? Yes, I just want to add there that I had toured the uh, Alaska search and rescue site. Are, are we discussing that now? Or? Oh, yeah, it is. Well, I, I'd like to. I had one too. So we have a request to pull. Basically, why do we even have a consent calendar? We're pulling everything off of the floor, <laughs> right? Except right. 11. Yeah, well, I suppose <coughs> yes, we're just, pulling 11. We've got one at a time with the corrections, and then we vote on everything except the one, 11, which you can vote on. Right, right. All right. right. Rather than pull, we just go through it. And so what are the, I got the, I got the uh, corrections on 7. All right. Thank you. Okay. What, do you have something on 7? Y yes, I do. Uh, July 15th also. And I will defer to uh, our our uh, our secretary here, but um, it relates to me in the, on page one of five. Uh, and this relates to me 
media, it says I arrived at approximately 5.15. My recollection was that I arrived at 5.05, .05, but I'm not quarreling with the official timekeeper. I, I wasn't there, so I'm just going oh. by. I'm not, I don't attend the questions. So I see. Well, can I correct that? I correct the final. Thank you. Okay. That's all I had at number seven. How about uh, number eight? Consider an approval resolution authorizing the fire chief <coughs> to sign a memorandum of understanding with the city of Menlo Park regarding the installation of police communications <coughs> fire district stations number one, two, and four. I, I have two two quick things on that. One is, I'd like to see us have a blanket motion to substitute the manager for the director on all tasks and all documents related to the city so we don't have to see these kinds of things in the future. That everything that was assigned to the director be decide, uh, assigned to the manager. And that those those be made, those changes be made without having to come to the board. Are you referencing item number nine or eight, director? Oh, eight. It's number eight. eight. It's number eight, eight speaks to an eight. MOU. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm yes, sorry. Different. I'm on the wrong one. That's okay. the okay. Park Park I, I apologize, I was looking at number nine. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so let me mention number eight, though. Um, I just, want, I was just curious if, if so we So you're okay with eight? No, I have a question now. No, you're okay with number eight. I have a question on number eight. Okay. I was just, there's two things, I have two questions. One is, I wonder if it's possible, if you have any idea how much electricity, just because we're in this sort of, I don't know a proper word for it, but there's this little contest that's going on sometimes between us and the city. How much do we spend on electricity for this communications equipment, roughly? I couldn't tell you other than it's, uh, you have probably three plug-in units up there, so it's, it's minimal. Like ten bucks a month or something, I would guess. Okay. The other thing I was going to ask is it's not metered, so we can't. No, and I, it should be metered. I'm not. I, I just there's no estimate made, and I just wanted to know if it was significant. But basically, you're saying it's not significant. The power is not significant. Right. Okay. And then Exhibit A has very specific equipment lists here. Will Will that have to change when Mellow Park changes what it does? Yes. And that's been part of the issue. I mean, formalizing this agreement, which is for the radio communications for the city mill park, primarily the police department and public works, was so that they just don't make changes and not tell the district what it is. Um, we've got a, This has been a handshake deal probably since the station was built in the 50s. And so, you know, there needs to be upgrades. One of the things we've told them there needs to be upgrades in their system as well. Well, I, I'd like to somehow authorize you to, to receive that and, and approve that rather than having to have this agreement come back to the board every time they change it. Won't. So the agreement won't come back to the board, the attachment will come back to the board, or come back to me, excuse me, uh, for any modifications that they make. And it will not have to come back to It us. will not have to come yeah. back to the Okay. And then I, I have no more problems with number eight. Okay. Number nine. Yeah, here's why I was asking if we couldn't just have a blanket motion that wherever we assign a duty to the human to the um, administrative services director that those duties be automatically assigned to the administration services manager so that this doesn't have to come before the board again <coughs> I mean basically we've replaced the director with the manager and I think I don't think this needs to have come before us That wasn't the, yeah, that, the finance committee felt differently, right? Well, we just wanted, I think it's fair to say that we wanted the board to know that in the absence of the chief being the treasurer, mm -hmm. that the board would be deciding on who that specific person was. So even, you know, whether or not there's a recognition from the chief, that's the only reason. Yep. What came to the finance committee, Chuck, was that it would be the, the treasurer or such person was appointed by the chief. The designee. And we felt that that was too imprecise. That if it's going to be a, the position of treasurer, which we consider to be very significant, uh, the board should be clear that that's who that person is. It shouldn't be somebody to be designated by the chief. And so the language here was designed to make it specific. 
Um, I think you raise a general question that I would recommend we just give back to the chief. In looking at other delegations, uh, do we make, at a next meeting, should we just make a general declaration that whenever it specifies uh, the administrative services manager, or the director of administrative services that's hereby replaced with service manager. But that was not the focus here. The focus here was to have the treasurer to be a designated individual, not to be somebody, whoever the, the chief chose to appoint without the board's knowledge. So the two different issues. I'm, I'm probably not explaining it well. No, no, I, I understand. I, I, did, I did not understand before I do now. Okay. I, I would recommend that we, I know it's not relevant to this, but I would recommend that we make a blanket thing just in, in the event that there are any um, responsibilities designated, or, you know, for the director that they just be assumed by the manager. Well, I think that's the case. I think if, if you're reading the discussion on this um, item, it was actually this board resolution that at that time delegated this duty to the director of administrative services. But that whole thing is, that title will be changed to uh, administrative services manager because we won't have a director of administrative services. So that me in reference to what you were talking, I think you're talking about this, that was specific to that particular resolution at that time. Board resolution number 1146, is that what you're talking about, Chuck? I, I don't, under the discussion area? Uh, I was confused what the issue was. Okay, but well I, the issue was to make sure that the designee would not, would be a clear designee to the board. Okay, and I, I didn't understand that, but I agree with, I agree with that. Okay, thanks. Uh, so you're okay with the number nine? Yeah, right? I'm not okay with okay. that. But I would recommend that we take care of the manager and director of the board mm -hmm. once and for all. Okay, number 10. It's an approval resolution awarding a contract for the purchase of the 2015 Chevy Dune Tow Vehicle. No question. I, I had two questions on this. Um, one is, I'm assuming that this is paid for by FEMA, is that correct? It is. And then, is that true of the uh, additional equipment that's paid? Any, anything that has to do with USAR is paid by USAR. So, so here's the second question. Once you get a quota on this additional equipment, um, do you have to come back to the board to deal with that? No, because the vehicle's over 50, so it goes to authority. So the equipment, obviously, it's not going to go that high. It's much less. So we wouldn't need to come back to the board for that. Okay. If he could give me an off of $1,228. It wouldn't have, yeah, it wouldn't have right. been here. Right. It's because it's over $50,000. Right. That's correct. Because Harold's the chief limit is 50000 okay. I, I was just trying to have this not come before us. So what I was going to suggest, but it's not, is that if you had an estimate, you know, up to $10,000 in equipment, and then we could approve it once and for all and be done with it. Yeah, now it's only really it's the vehicle. And, but I, I thought maybe, I thought FEMA sometimes required us. FEMA, we have to follow actually the district's purchasing policies. So FEMA has requirements, but part of the requirements for the district, because it's the, it's the uh, you know, contracting agency for FEMA, is that we follow district policy for purchasing. Okay, well, in any case, my goal here was simply to save time for the board. I, I agree, Director. I wish it was different, but that's the rule. I don't have any problem with that tomorrow. 12? Oh, you didn't have a problem? No. Okay. So I'll so move, move to um, vote on the consent calendar with the changes in the minutes, um, but also leaving out at this time item number 11 to be decided on. Second. Consent calendar minus item number, number 11. 11. Yes. Right. I can vote on that. I can't vote on can't item vote number 11. 11. Right. Okay. So that's so all right. in favor for. But why is why why are you saying all in favor? Because <coughs> it's prerogative. No. Because I'm. I gave it to her. The consent calendar because he has to recuse himself. I'm sorry. I'm just confused. That's okay. So all in favor. Aye. 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 Rob. Aye. 
So that passes unanimously. So number I, the number 11, item 11, is to consider and approve revisions to the revenues and expenditures of the California Task Force 3 Urban Search and Rescue Budget for all fiscal year 2013-14 for cooperative agreements. Um, EMW20120, etc., and the other the others as well, and for the cooperative agreements. I move approval. Is there a second? I second. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 In one in table. That's me. Okay. So four I and one uh, refusal. Director I. Thank you. Thanks. All right. With that, that brings us to our regular agenda. All right? Uh, that brings us to item number 13. <coughs> approve a resolution authorizing the purchase of modular buildings from Cal State construction in the amount of $75,240. Move Second. Move. Semi trucks, we could do it ourselves. I would recommend it. I see. The people, the people that move these things do it for a living, so you could probably hire them again to do it. Which is the plan. And where would we, where would we store it? For now, we keep it at Station Two until the construction is done, and then after that, we're looking at we can either keep it at the site, or we could hopefully have it, the building demolished over at Station Six or wherever we're going to build it. Well. It just seems like we'd be lucky to be moving on construction by the time building to uh, uh, session two is true. But it was much. This building is unique in that we put sprinklers in it, and it's also got um, a ballistic barrier in it that to redo this building. 